what's new on the Burlington waterfront. Hey, now it's happening at the waterfront on Lake Champlain. Whatever the weather, there's so much to do on the new waterfront, the Burlington waterfront. Welcome to On the Waterfront. I'm your host, Mariah Riggs. And this month, I'm excited to have Betsy Walkerman, who's the president of Patient Choices Vermont, here with me today. Welcome, Betsy. Thanks very much, Mariah. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about your background. I understand you were a lawyer. You're, you are a lawyer. Yes, I'm a lawyer. You're a lawyer, <laughs> which is very important uh, for patients being able to have choices. And I was kind of curious how, as a lawyer, you ended up coming to Patient Choices Vermont. Well, it was interesting. I actually, a lot of my background is, has been in finance and entrepreneurial strategy. And I was working away one day and my dad called and said, I wanna come up and visit you and talk about something important. And my dad, Dick Walters, ended up being the founder of this organization in 2002 and um, along with my mother, Ginny Walters. And what he wanted to talk about in all that time, 22 years ago, <laughs> was um, getting a law in place like the one at the time that they had and still have in Oregon um, to enable people who are approaching the end of life to um, have a little bit of control over the timing of their death. Mm -hmm. And um, so he, was asking for advice and help. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got involved. <laughs> and so 11 yeah. years later, um, 11 years later, Act 39, Vermont's Patient Choice at End of Life bill was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. Did you work on that? Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. I worked all the way through that 11 years. So, okay, that's, that's a good <laughs> point. So you met with him and then you spent the next 11 years working on legislation. Yes, to, yes. To have it move through the state legislature and pass as a law in Vermont. There was a great deal of education to do. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of research to do. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of um, both fundraising and um, coalition building to do. And so many people got involved throughout the whole state. Just thousands of people came forward to really um, help with this initiative. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. And I guess also for our viewers, just so they understand, so this movement started in Oregon, right? Yes. And how did, what was the Oregon bill that you were looking at um, 22 years ago? Yeah, it's actually very similar to okay. our medical aid and dying law because we modeled ours after theirs. Okay. Um, there's passed by referendum where all the voters get to vote on what they want. Vermont was actually the first state that passed such a law by legislation. Yeah, which is a much harder process for yes. those of you who are unaware of that. Yeah. Um, it can be much more difficult to get anything through uh, the legislative process uh, because bills die, they get forgotten about, and um, it can be quite a slog from what I understand. It can be, it can be, but it was a good process. I mean, yeah. it, one of the amazing things about Vermont and I, is just the way that the legislators studied the facts mm -hmm. so hard and listened to all the people who had opinions on many, many hearings um, and then came up with a law that really fit. Yeah, it's a real grassroots kind of like organic process in Vermont. It is, it is. And it's I, like that groundswell. That, that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Which is wonderful. And it really works in a state like Vermont. It does. It, actually, there was a session that I did at one point for a bunch of students who were studying how democracy works. Wow. And it was a textbook case <laughs> <laughs> of a grassroots movement. All right, you got to, to, to mix interdisciplinary action, which is always, which is always the best kind of learning. Yeah. And, and that's exciting. So I, um, before we kind of get into Patient Choices of Vermont, um, I thought this would be a good opportunity uh, for us to take uh, a look at the introductory video um, that you guys have put together. Is there anything you'd like to tell anybody about uh, the video before we watch it? Yeah, the video is posted on our website, mm -hmm. uh, which is patientchoices.org. 
And there are quite a few videos on the website, and then we realized that we didn't have a really short one. <laughs> and so we did a really short one that just introduces you to the people and the process, and then we can get into the questions that people often ask mm -hmm. once they see that kind of introduction. All right, wonderful. So uh, enjoy the video, um, and uh, we'll be right back. Thank you. At any given time, 5,000 Vermonters are living with a diagnosis of a terminal illness, and they are making choices about their end-of-life care and plans. These are the faces of some of the people who have chosen medical aid in dying over the past eight years since Vermont's Act 39 was adopted. They and their families frequently write with deep gratitude for the peace this option has provided. Every person qualifying for aid in dying must be diagnosed by two doctors as having a terminal illness with six months or less to live, and they must be capable of making their own medical decisions. When Act 39 was finalized in 2013, legislators placed great weight on preventing improper use of the law, so the process includes five qualification requirements, an eight-step procedure, and full documentation. Participation in the law is completely voluntary. Vermont is among 11 states that have similar laws, providing end-of-life choice to 22% of Americans today. Thank you very much for your interest. Medical aid in dying is an important and powerful option in the spectrum of compassionate care toward the end of life. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, so, uh, Betsy, um, I kind of wanted to dig in a little bit more into, um, you know, Patient Choices Vermont talks about end of life care. And so, I mean, some people in our viewership might not be very aware of what end of life care really is. So, how would you describe end of life care and what are the options associated with it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, just, just to put some perspective around it, mm -hmm. um, people who are approaching the end of life may do so actually many years before they actually die, or, the, or it may come about pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And over time, since the early part of the 1900s, our, our um, life expectancy has gotten longer and longer. It used to be 50 years. Now it's more like 70 or 80 years for some mm -hmm. people longer. And that is great with the medical advances we have, but what people just started discovering mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s was that sometimes medical advances enabled us to prolong life, mm -hmm. but without real regard to the, um, to the values and the priorities of the individual person. And so there started to be a convergence of trends from the 80s and 90s, first with advanced directives and then later on with medical aid in dying, putting more, um, more autonomy mm -hmm. back with the individual person mm -hmm. who, um, who is facing the end of life. And so medical aid in dying now sits in a spectrum of care, which includes hospice care and palliative care. Um, palliative care can include all kinds of um, what is the treatment and between comfort. palliative and hospice care? They overlap. Okay, because I've <laughs> always been very confused. Okay, and I thought you might be able to. So they do overlap. Oh, they absolutely overlap. Okay. Um, palliative care can come into play even when people have a temporary or serious illness and are dealing with a lot of pain or need, needing to gain more mobility back or just um, just really needing the attention of um, a practitioner who, a medical practitioner mm -hmm. who, um, who is skilled in um, guiding somebody through with a combination of lifestyle and medication um, or other so it's more of a rehabilitational type program it can for quality be. of life. It can be, but mm -hmm. it is also very, um, very appropriate to end of life mm -hmm. at a point when 
people probably are not going to recover. Okay. Yep. And really are worried about what's coming and not wanting to live in pain, mm -hmm. not wanting to be overly dependent, worried about who's going to take care of them. And then you start to get an overlap with hospice. Okay. So anybody approaching the end of life who has a six month diagnosis or a six month prognosis mm -hmm. um, is eligible to um, participate in hospice. Okay, all right. Who provide a very, very skilled, very comprehensive um, support all the way through the end of life, including both social work and mm -hmm. spiritual help, as well as um, pain management mm -hmm. and end of life management. Yeah, and I, it's interesting because you're sort of talking about this convergence in the 80s and 90s and how there was a realization that end-of-life care uh, needed uh, different types of protections and different ways of looking at it because we were extending the, the life, but the quality of life sometimes in the medical practice of keeping people alive wasn't a part of that. And there was sort of a disconnect between those two, those two things. Like people were staying alive, but it, what is the quality of life and what is the life that you're keeping alive and human choice and uh, free will around that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's become complicated to die. <laughs> you know, it, it, just, well, I mean, um, my great-grandmother was in the house and, you know, the dog, I mean, back in the day, it, it, it was a much more organic, natural, holistic, usually in the home, you know, families were involved, you know, the doctor would come to the house. It was a very different kind of format and everything's gotten much more institutionalized and, um, you know, it, you're, you're separated from it now. And that, that's what, when you talk to people, mm -hmm. they want to die at home. They want to die with their families around them. Mm -hmm. And mostly they're thinking about living. Yeah. They're thinking about what's my quality of life? Am I going to be able to connect with the people I love in my last weeks or months? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to need to have so much pain medication that I'm really not all here and able to connect. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the things people want. And so the introduction of the option of medical aid in dying is one attempt to try to rebalance this mm -hmm. and to be able to bring people that option to yeah, it's die a choice. at home. It's, it's the free will to choose your own destiny. Yes. Um, which is integral to human freedom, um, it could be argued our personal freedom, right? Right. Um, which life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, right, is a very <laughs> important cornerstone of our founding democracy. So it, it, I think it's really crucial, the kind of work that you guys are doing. Um, so uh, end of life care, I just wanted to kind of get back in here to it. Um, medical aid and dying, how would you define that to our audience? Yeah, so medical aid and dying in the U.S. Mm -hmm. is, um, is defined very much by, um, by the requirements to qualify for medical aid in dying. Um, so it's available to people who have a six month diagnosis with a terminal illness, okay. people who are 18 years or older. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to make your own healthcare decisions, mm -hmm. so nobody can make this decision for you which is obviously very important. Very important, and that's actually the case everywhere in the world. <laughs> which is important to note, in case anybody's heard otherwise. Right, uh, there yeah. are often a lot of sensationalized stories mm -hmm. about elsewhere in the world. Um, nobody can make the decision for you anywhere in the world. But um, the thing that sets the U.S. apart is that um, all of the laws in the 10 states that have mm -hmm. medical aid in dying um, require self-administration of the medication. Okay. So you have to be able to take the medication yourself. Which I would assume there's kind of a, a, there might be a little bit of a conflict of interest with the Hippocratic Oath and doctors. Um, the Hippocratic Oath. Yeah. You know, the Hippocratic Oath in its very, very short form says do no, do no harm. Uh, yeah. But I actually, when we started, I used to study Greek. Yeah. And in Hippocrates yeah. was the the yeah, Greek, the, yeah, the yeah, Greek yeah. philosopher. Yeah. 
there's much more behind the Hippocratic Oath than, than what some people often say. And it really comes back to patient choice and patient care. Well, well of course, but I think it's very interesting. I think that's <laughs> part of the self-determination of it is that the patient actually is able to choose and do it for themselves. Right, that's it's a, right. It's, it's an important point right. for people. Um, so um, I wanted to, uh, I was a little curious, um, we, getting back to the video. Um, the people in the video, can you share a little bit more about the stories we just watched? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, that's why when we put together the video, instead of just saying, you know, these are all the requirements, you can read that in a brochure. <laughs> you know, you can read that in a brochure, you can read that on our website. But when you hear the stories of the actual people, and these are people whose videos are uh, on the website, um, it just, um, it's really heartwarming. So the first, um, the first person whose picture came up was my dad. And at the time that um, the law was passed, um, we didn't know that he would be diagnosed with lung cancer. But two years later, that was the case, and he was declining very quickly. Mm. Um, he managed to spend his last summer on Lake Champlain like your beautiful pictures. <laughs> I was looking at your pictures to see, I wonder if I see his boat, you know? Um, and, then, um, and then he was declining very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, some people who choose medical aid in dying pick a date, and other people just wait until they feel, okay, today is the day. My dad picked the date. Wow. And he picked a date about five days away. Um, it was an incredible time. It opened up this space when people didn't need to pretend anything anymore. Hmm. When it was very clear, he, he was very upfront about it, made it clear that he was leaving. Mm -hmm. And um, it, my job that week was to call lots of old friends and say, Dad says he's leaving on Friday. And if you want to talk to him, now's your chance. And it opened up this unbelievable space for connection. Wow. He told me this was, um, like, that he had some of the most meaningful conversations of his whole life in that last week. Um, people opened up in a way that he'd never experienced before. Well, there's a certain honesty. There is. There's a certain honesty there. Um, where you don't deal with the, you know, artifice of like, you know, social interactions or those kinds of things. All those walls are broken down and there's something in its purest form. It, it was really special. And um, I was just so grateful he had that time. And that we had that time, our family and our friends, that we had that time with him. Um, those who knew my dad, and there were many of them around the state because of this, all this work. Um, came for the last pieces of Dick's advice, <laughs> which he freely disseminated. Um, but, um, and, yeah. And he could, decim he could actually talk to people about things and, and communicate, and probably the engagement for him was, was a very valuable uh, That was life-giving yeah. for him. Yeah. It was life-giving knowing that he, um, he had this plan and, um, and that he was, um, had that measure of control mm -hmm. at a time when you really are losing every measure of control that you ever had. Yes. And um, when he got to his last day, he was um, very deliberate, very much at peace. Um, the last day of, um, for medical aid in dying, mm -hmm. for most people involves exactly what we did, family gathering, quiet time. Um, times to say goodbye, and then there, the medication is in a drink that the patient drinks, and um, we can talk more about yeah, yeah, what we, happens we will, yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, very, very peaceful. And on your own terms. Absolutely which is on in, your own terms. Yeah. And, and how you want to be with the people you care and love about. Um, I, uh, I, I can imagine that that's something that's that's, that's very relieving on some level for certain people. 
It, it is. It's not, not yeah. everybody wants to choose no. that route. But Other, is the point, is the choice. Exactly. Right, that that is an option. And there are those people out there that crave that at the end, of, that, that need that at their end of their life for their own personal solace and their, their own being. What was really interesting to me a couple of years ago mm -hmm. was um, we had a couple of people contact us right literally the week before they died. We actually three of them who um, had heard that we were um, um, suggesting to legislators that we improve Act 39 by allowing some of the process to happen through telemedicine. And they wanted to um, participate in that advocacy, uh -huh. even though they were literally days wow. from the end of their lives. And one of them, we have a lovely video of Karen Olschlager on our, on our um, on our website, mm -hmm. and her picture is the second picture in that intro video. <laughs> it's one of many that are on her website. I would really encourage people to just and, go and, listen and to her name? voice. Her name is Karen Olschlager. Okay. Karen Olschlager? Mm. Okay, so check that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Karen um, was 35 when she contacted us. Um, mm -hmm. She had been dealing with um, a diagnosis of stomach cancer for two or three years. Mm -hmm. She had been through multiple rounds of chemotherapy um, and had been through remission and had had um, more time for um, both work, which she was very, very proud of. She was a prosecutor. Um, and, um, and recreation, she loved the mountains and hiking. And it was just fascinating listening to her. She, uh, she talked about how, especially as a young cancer patient, there was just mm -hmm. so much social pressure to fight and fight and fight mm -hmm. and fight. And how at some point she knew, you know, mm -hmm. there were, it was really more about suffering than it was about fighting. Mm -hmm. And she ended up spending her last few months going to yoga retreats, knowing that she had qualified for medical aid in dying and that she could choose and she was going to pass away. But it sounds like she was able to take care of her own uh, life care in something that was very holistic to her mm -hmm. um, and that she was able to uh, build up her spirit and her soul, I mean, if you will, to the next place, right? By, by being able to have, you know, the freedom of that choice allowed her to embrace the end of her life as, as something that was engaging and uplifting for her in her soul as she left, as opposed to something that she was concerned about how, you know, some people, especially patients, don't even know, um, you know, how the end of their life is gonna go. And I can imagine that being very scary. Well, for some people it's scary. She actually didn't seem scared. <laughs> um, she, you know, so I don't want to interpret no, for no, no, her, no, no, but, I know. but yeah. Um, yeah, so if you listen, if you listen to her video or if, you know, if viewers listen to her, yeah. uh, watch her video, there are lovely pictures. Um, it was really important to her to be part of that advocacy right toward the end. She wanted to have a purpose toward the yeah. end of life as well. And, um, yeah, so, um, and when people go to the website, one of the things that um, that you can do is to mm -hmm. sign up for our email newsletter. And okay. um, we don't inundate everybody every day or even every week. <laughs> um, and we only fundraise really seriously twice a year. So the rest of it is all um, really newsworthy information or mm -hmm. tips or ideas um, or um, answers to questions that people often ask us or news stories about, um, about end of life and things that are relevant. That's interesting. So both young and older people use aid in dying. What are the reasons you see that they seek it out? And what is, you said to qualify, um, you listed a couple of qualifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so you have to have a six month diagnosis mm -hmm. of a terminal illness. But you know, most of the people who qualify for medical aid mm -hmm. in dying um, are people who are dealing with cancer. Okay. And so, and lots of people who deal with cancer, if not most, I don't know the statistics, but they, they, um, they have been dealing with um, this situation for years, like mm -hmm. Karen. Yeah. 
um, you know, it's not something you get diagnosed with and most of the time and decline within a month. It's not, it's generally not that quick. Um, so people have a long time to think about it and they have a long time to consider what they really want for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And um, do you work with people who are wondering about the end of their life or where would somebody go um, in, in that particular situation uh, to find out about their end of life choices? We work with people mostly who are exploring whether they want to consider medical aid in dying. Okay. And the decision is always with the individual mm -hmm. at every step of the process. You may qualify and then you may even get the medication and then decide not to use it. Mm -hmm. um, so we, um, we help people understand exactly what it means and what it doesn't mean. Mm -hmm. We have a very, very in-depth set of resources on our website, including um, one of the most important pages is how to talk to your doctor how to have a conversation with your doctor because the doctor's involvement is really critical in the process. Um, it's the doctor who is going to help you understand what all your alternatives mm -hmm. are, um, what, your, um, what your disease progression might look like, yeah. and what um, kinds of care and treatment might be available for you, um, and really help coach you through that decision. And understand the decision. Right. Um, I mean, I believe that education is probably an incredibly important component. It's very, very important. One of the things that we did in the last um, year and a half was to pull together um, a clinician's guide. Oh, wow. So clinicians um, have, have a resource. Is that on your website? It's absolutely on our website. Okay. Yeah. And so it's available. It's used mostly by doctors. Mm -hmm. and hospice professionals, um, social workers, anybody who is working with people who are going through this kind of decision-making process. Yeah, it's and the first of its kind in the country. Which, oh, well, which is really that, interesting. That's yeah. wonderful, and you would, think, you would think everybody would have, I mean, what an incredible and valuable resource that people can actually look up and find information about. Right. Um, which is very valuable, because right. in order to understand a choice, you actually have to research it. You do. It takes um, it takes some work. Mm -hmm. This is not an easy process to go through. It's kind of um, um, almost intentionally a little bit a yeah. little bit challenging. Mm -hmm. um, well, as it should be. It's 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 a major life decision. Yes, quite literally. And anybody who's thinking about that or is suffering, um, it's important to really know the different paths that you have in front of you. Right. Right. So you can make the right choice. Right. Um, We've so. referred a couple times to these these little brochures, which are <laughs> trifold <laughs> brochures, and yeah. um, these are available um, to community groups. Mm -hmm. um, if there are community groups or churches um, um, who. Um, we've, who would like presentations by our volunteers, um, we, we bring these, we send them, um, we tell stories, we have conversations, we talk about people's concerns. Um, but the, this is a very quick introduction to medical aid in dying, mm -hmm. and the same information is, um, is on one of the resource pages on our website. So um, who else plays a key role in this process, besides the doctors and the patients? I mean, I'm assuming families. Families do. Um, usually, um, usually the, the patients have mm -hmm. their conversations with their families. And, um, and generally what we hear is that um, families are really supportive. They just want the person to have what they want. Yeah. They have the rest of their life the way they want it. And they, and they want them. to be there for the people they love. And support them and, 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 and know that they're there for them. Right. Which is so important. Right. Um, um, I was going to say most of the patients also have, um, are enrolled in hospice. Okay. And that means that um, they have the support of the social workers and mm -hmm. uh, the counsel, whatever kind of counselors they offer that you know, Well, I assume mental health want. is a major component of a lot of what's happening at end of life. Um, I mean, it's very tough, not just for the patient, but for the people around them. It's interesting how the decision um, 
the decision becomes very clear for people. It's like a crystal clear, like this amazing, huh? It becomes very clear. Hmm. So it is, it's, it's, and it's, it's interesting, it has a certain directive component to it. There's a clarity of mind. I mean, I, I can imagine, I mean, it's a very evocative, important choice in somebody's life, especially at that point. Um, so I, I, I mean, I want to go through a little bit more of the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. we, can, <laughs> we can probably uh, spend a long time getting emotionally uh, into it. But I, I want to talk about what is it like for the patient to go through the process? I think that's an important thing for people to hear. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, thanks. Um, What's well, always really helpful to start the conversation early. It doesn't mean you have to finish the, um, the process right away. But I think, honestly, to turn it around a little bit, the saddest calls that we get are ones from people who have waited too long mm -hmm. and then um, don't have the time frame that they need to really complete the process. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the, the legislate, the process that's in the legislation um, requires um, two requests, two verbal requests to your doctor, okay. the person who's going to prescribe the medication, and that has to be 15 days apart. Okay. But in practice, we all know how long it takes to get appointments, yep. so we recommend two months. Mm -hmm. um, you have to then be seen, um, have an appointment with a consulting physician okay. um, who provides a second opinion that you qualify, mm -hmm. and you also have to make a written request. So those are the things that are in the, on the patient side mm -hmm. of the process. Um, the prescribing physician then has a number of steps that they have to go through, um, uh, including making sure the patient has um, received all the information about all their alternatives and, um, and that they have, um, you know, um, s that they're not being in, uh, influenced yeah. by anybody else and yes, that they're exactly. making their own decision and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And affirming that this is really a choice and that they see that and... Yes. Of course, and signing yes. off on that as the medical care professional. Yes. So in, initially it was really difficult for patients because every doctor in Vermont was doing this for the first time. Yeah. And that's still the case sometimes, yep. you know, that doctors are doing it for the first time. Um, do you help patients who are trying to go through the process? Can we they do. come to you? Okay. We do. Um, we do. Most of the time now in Vermont, for a Vermont patient, um, there are, there's enough knowledge out there among primary care physicians and specialists mm -hmm. that, um, um, that we don't get too many requests for, to help mm -hmm. coach them through. Um, but, um, but we do get requests from the doctors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so the doctors will call. Well, they want to make sure they're doing it all. They want to make sure that they're fo exactly yeah. following yep. the procedure. They might, um, yeah, they might want consultation and, and um, about the various steps of the procedure, yeah. So I, um, I, this has been a real pleasure. Betsy, thank you so thank much you. for coming on and talking to us about all the wonderful work you do. Um, if you guys get a chance, please go to patientchoices.org. Uh, check out the literature there. Um, There's some great resources both for doctors and patients and families. Um, uh, it's an amazingly uh, compassionate and uh, wonderful program. Um, and thank you so much for all the work you've done to bring this to Vermont. I really appreciate that, Betsy. I'm sure we all do. Um, and uh, thank you guys so much. Have a great month, and I'll see you right back here thank in you. October. Thank you, Mariah.